Welcome, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about Chapter 3, the technical background of the EEG and ERP for complementary alternative and functional medicine practitioners and their patients. So the technical background of what we're doing is we're trying to gather data that we can apply to statistics. So now I teach statistics for the Vollmer Institute in California. It's a, a wonderful uh, small school that teaches forensics and um, polygraph. And so I teach neurophysiology there. Both there and here, we have to talk about statistics without math. So I'm gonna to try to talk about statistics without math, which is a tall order. So what we're trying to do as we gather these brain waves is we're looking at standard deviation. Now, standard deviation means that for all of the data that we gather, if we gather enough data points, and I'm not talking about five or 10 data points, I'm talking about thousands of data points, we would like to be able to take all those data points and put them together on a chart, and on a chart that measures them from the lowest to the highest. Let's say that we all went to the store today and I, I took you all out on a field trip. I said, let's go out on a field trip and we're going to look in, in, at this big store and we're going to look at all the different heights of people and we're going to measure a few people and we're gonna guess, guess at the height of a, of a bunch of people and we're going to have a station where people just step up and we measure their height and they step down and they're gone. So it's, it's very little bothersome for them. They, it's very little investment that we just say, come and help us out by measuring your height. And so by the end of the day, we have thousands of people that go through this, this massive store, well, hundreds of people that go through this massive, massive uh, warehouse store and we, uh, have this data by the end of the day of all of the people that got their height measured. And let's say that we make sure they're adults, right? Over 18. So all of that data will fall on a bell curve that looks like this. So if that data falls on a bell curve, there will be an average or a mean that is right in the middle of that bell curve. And that average will be the number that most of the people, uh, the, the most cluster of people will, will have as their height. And maybe it's five foot four, maybe it's five foot six. I don't know, maybe it's five foot seven, who knows? It'll certainly be different in Denmark and, and, uh, and other parts of, of the world than it would be in, say, Tokyo, but there is a different mean or different average. And so that is the center of the bell curve. Now, you may have heard of, of grading on a curve uh, where we, we grade people on a curve. That doesn't work for a classroom of 30 people. It works very well for, you know, 100, uh, several hundred people, but it doesn't work for, you know, 30 students. So um, uh, you're going um, to you're gonna see this bell curve all the time. And you could, you could put the data from anything on a bell curve. You could put the size, the relative size of, of all the planets that we can see in the sky. You could put the relative brightness of all the stars that we see in the sky. You could put the height of, of people, as I said. You could do the weight of people, as I said. And, and you, you just have to do selection criteria. And for that group of whatever you're measuring, there will be a bell curve. So that bell curve is called a Gaussian curve. And once we have that bell curve established for a large data set, we can then start to cut it up. We can start to carve it up and we can start to say, hmm, where do we want to call normal and where do we want to call not so normal? Now in medicine, um, we use this, this formula called the standard deviation formula. And it's a fairly complex formula, but I'm not going to hit you with that. We take this formula and we apply some numbers to it. And what it does is it gives us these bars, these lines that are a certain distance away from the mean. So if the mean is the middle and it's the center of this curve and the curve looks the same on both sides, there's going to be a hump and there's going to be a long tail going to the high end and a long tail going to the low end. And certainly most of the people will be here at, at, in the middle. And so we would say that that cluster represents most of the people. So this standard deviation idea means that when we go out a certain distance and we draw a line, we say all the people within that number uh, of maybe five foot zero to maybe six foot two, Maybe that's the highest density of people. I don't know, but we'd have to crunch the numbers and discover what it was for that day of, of data that we gathered that I was just talking about in the store. And we'd say most of the people fit in this range or, or you know, 34% of them fit in this range or 68% of them fit in this range. And then we go to the next one and the next one, the next one, the next one. And so all of these different lines allow us to carve up the, the set of information. And usually science, uh, scientists generally say that when you get out to three or four standard deviations, so three this way and three this way, those would be where there's a cutoff. And that's where we start seeing very few people. That would be like where we see people that are like seven feet tall. And down here, adults over 18 that are under four feet tall. 
you just don't see it very often. You do once in a while, but the 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 frequency or of occurrence of it is so very low in both the high tall people that are super tall and the and the super short people that are are, are super shorter than than the average. So in laboratory science, most of the time when we do lab tests, like for example, your test of, of blood chemistry, all the different very various tests that you use, those generally fall in three to four standard deviations from the mean. Somewhere around three to four standard deviations from the mean, which is out here, that's very few people. So that might mean somebody's got really high blood glu glucose and it puts them in the third standard deviation, the third line from the middle, either positive or negative, high or low. So if your blood sugar is really high or really low and it falls on the other side of the third or fourth standard deviation line, what's calculated by the math, then we say your blood sugar is too high, you're sick. Or we say your blood sugar is too low, you're sick. And if you're within that line, we say you're normal, it's okay. Now, why do we do that? We do that because we have to establish some criteria for what is disease and what is pathology and what is normal and what is abnormal and what are we going to treat and what are we going to say, hmm, not worth intervening because we have to we have to realize that our inter interventions are, are are toxic so with uh, an individual we need to be able to say here is the line of pathology and that is usually a very wide line three to four standard deviations from the mean now when we look at health and wellness the general trend in health and wellness is to look at one to 1.5 to 1.65 to two standard deviations from the mean, which is tighter. It involves a tighter cluster of people that we would presume are more healthy and more closer to the average. So if your blood sugar was not quite as high or not quite as low, you would presumably be a little healthier because you might be within the two standard deviation lines. So you are between the mean and the first standard deviation line and the second standard deviation line, but not the third and fourth. So being here, means uh, that you're not out here. So we consider this range and this range pathology. We consider this range and this range not quite as healthy, functionally not, not so well, and, and deserving of treatment. And then within here, normal, and there's really no reason to treat because we can't find evidence that you're, you're basically as, as perfect as you could be. If you're within, uh, in brain waves, it's usually 1.65 standard deviations from the mean. And in laboratory tests, a lot of times they use 1.5 to 2.5. And that makes sense. It's a pretty, pretty reasonable range. So um, essentially, most people will fall in this, this middle area, and those people we presume are the healthiest. So healthiest, not so healthy, departure from wellness, and then pathology, sick, really need medical treatment and qualify for diagnosis. So with brain waves, we're doing the same thing. We're taking the brain waves, we're measuring the power and amplitude of them, and we're saying, man, your, your brain is putting out way too much voltage, way too much power, way, way too much loudness. It's like if your brain was a bunch of singers in a chorus, they're singing way too loud. And that would place you over here at the high range of the distribution of the data. Or on the other hand, sometimes we see brains that are, there's a particular frequency and they're not putting out very much of that. And so they would have a very low amplitude or low voltage. We might say that if they were choral members, they were singing too quietly and the conductor would say, hey, I need more of you. I need more cowbell, come out more. And so they would be, they would be very, very uh, low amplitude, low uh, power, low voltage, low volume, and it's too low. And so we need to train that part of the brain, that frequency to come up. And we need to train that part of the brain who is too loud to come down. And that's what neurofeedback does. That's also what supplements and dietary uh, chemistry is done, is, is goal is, is to normalize chemistry of those cells. And that's also what brain exercises are designed to do, is to help bring, bring brain cells back into the normal range. So their, their frequency of firing and their amplitude of firing is closer to normal. And we can detect that using this beautiful tool called EEG and uh, QEG. One of the things that comes up with the technical background here after standard deviation is the question, do I have brain damage? So one of the things that patients see when they first look at their report and the doctor shows it to them on a screen or on a piece of paper or or whatever, is they start seeing the colors. They start seeing their brain and they start seeing red and blue and green and they don't know what it means. And their first question is, oh my God, I've, I see all this red or all this blue and it looks scary. And it's this region of my brain and oh my God, do I have a brain tumor? Do I have brain damage? The, the common question is not so much do I have a brain tumor as do I have brain damage? Well, no, not usually. And the reason for this is most people that present to an alternative practitioner have already been to 
uh, the medical profession, they've already been to their standard medical doctor, sometimes their neurologist, and they've been told you're not sick enough to um, be in a brain clinic. Um, so, uh, you know, you're not, you're not drooling, you're not having facial distortions, you're not, you can still talk, you don't have palsies of your arm or palsies of your leg, palsies of your head and face, you don't have distortions, postural distortions, you don't have um, upper motor neuron lesions or lower motor neuron lesions, um, decorticate or, or, or uh, decerebrate posturing that can happen with people. If you don't have that, medicine often says, well, you know, you're, you're, you, you just need, um, you know, neurobehavioral and learning types of things, you don't really have serious brain damage. And in many cases, the patients have already had an MRI. Now, in the United States, we are MRI happy in that we shoot too many MRIs of people that are unnecessary because they really don't need them. But we have more MRIs than any other country, and uh, we got to use them. So <laughs> I guess we, we do that. But um, many, many people have already gotten an MRI, and their brain is, is medically normal, anatomically normal. It means that there's been no hard lesions or, or pathological or ablative, or destructive lesions uh, in their brain showing tissue damage. So they have symptoms, they have problems, and they have misfirings of their brain, but they don't qualify as tissue pathology. The cells are not actually destroyed. They're just electrically not working quite right, and that's, that's called a functional lesion, as opposed to an ablative or destructive lesion. So when, we, when people come in, most of the time we tell them, look, you don't have any signs of brain damage. You have signs of brain dysfunction, brain imbalance, and that is not a medical diagnosis, and sometimes it's not considered medical necessity. Unless it happens after a car accident. Now, in many cases, there's the world of personal injury, and I won't talk about that much today, but I just want to mention that a person may have a certain level of performance of their brain that they had before an accident, and then they have an accident, and it changes their level of performance. Now, it may be hard to prove pathology, but they don't function the same, and sometimes we can measure that they don't function the same with their brain waves. And then we can get them back to pre-injury status, which is the goal of personal injury. So that does happen. Mm -hmm.